Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. I'm Will Schick. It's very exciting to be here with you guys today, and I am looking forward to today's episode. I have something very special to show off. We have the Infinity War Organized Play Kit, which is going to be hitting stores next month in March. So if you have a local game store, retailer, and you're interested in getting your hands on the materials that we're going to show in this kit, be sure to be talking to them about how to run organized play and bring it into the stores. Um, one of the big things that I want to talk about as well with this is kind of our changes to organized play. We talked about this back when we released Vibranium Heist at the end of last year. But of course, the global pandemic has really changed the way in which we view organized play and the way in which we go forward with this stuff. So one of the biggest changes overall to note is the fact that you no longer have to do these events specifically in store. In fact, we've opened up a whole lot of options for retailers and communities based on their current situation. And now all of our play, because it's play-focused organized play, is open to effectively allowing players to schedule games uh, over a longer course or period of time, to do so at alternate locations if they need to, or venues where they're um, able to maintain proper social distancing and all that good stuff. What this really means is that you're still going to get all of the cool stuff. You're going to be able to do so in a very safe way that is appropriate for the area and the condition of the global pandemic that you're in. And we're still going to have all these awesome play experiences and get a lot of really cool stuff to expand the value of our collections and to be able to play all of this fun stuff in the future with friends and new players who come into the game as well. So with that, let's go ahead and just dive in. I'm going to jump the camera off of me here and we're going to uh, get moving on this sweet unboxing. All right. So here is the Infinity War Organized Play Event Kit. Again, your stores are able to order this from their specific Asmodee distributor. Uh, right now, get it. It's going to be running in March, but of course, your store and area can run it whenever works best for you. Uh, this kit is going to take care of eight people. So if you happen to have a large community of that, you're going to want to make sure that the store knows uh, to order appropriately. One of the really things that I love about the way in which we do organize play is that the biggest reward that you get is, of course, all of the great materials that you get to keep after the event itself. Um, so let's go ahead and just crack this thing open, and we're going to open up and take a look at the different contents. So you're going to notice that of all kinds of goodies in here. Here's the stack of stuff. So let's go through these. Um, you're going to get the event organizer is going to get the instructions, which is going to explain how to run the league. And this one is a little different in terms of uh, from the last times by Brainium Heist, which was more of a single kind of one and done kit where you had the um, unique and specific mission where one player played the Killmonger raid scenario. Uh, coming in and breaking in and stealing vibranium and the other player played the defense force trying to stop the killmonger player from doing so with the unique killmonger card uh, this is actually meant to be played over the course of three weeks uh, each week you're going to play a number of games you're going to get to update and um, improve your abilities and your control over the said infinity stones that's why we kind of called it uh, the infinity war so um, those of you who played in the Gen Con event last year when we did Virtual Gen Con, you're going to notice that some of the missions that were pulled from that are very similar to this. In fact, um, we did utilize this kit, which was delayed at the time due to the global pandemic as kind of inspiration for that. Um, but this really opens up that event in brand new ways and ways that are much more exciting. So one of the things that I think is most cool about this event kit is that it provides a whole host of new crisis cards, which are specific to the Infinity League event. So you're gonna get uh, three new extract crises and three new secure crises. And these are all themed around the different Infinity Gems themselves. So this, um, each one of these has a very unique play style. You take two of them together in the event itself. Each player doesn't bring their own three crisis cards. They simply bring the secure and the extract decks. Um, you do have some choice in which ones you play. You put them together just like in a normal mission and those two become the mission that you play. And so there's a lot of really crazy things. Um, the mind, the mind war one is one of my favorites. You get to pick up mind stone shards. You can control the other, the opposing players and characters by interacting, um, and controlling the, uh, central throne. So 
these are used specifically in the event, but of course, nothing stops you from using these in your own games at home against opponents uh, with their consent and all that stuff. So these are just three brand new uh, crises, both secure and extraction, that you can throw into your normal games after the event itself. Um, they're a lot of fun to mix in with some of the normal crises as well. So this is just really going to expand your play opportunities and a lot of the fun that you can have if you want to do something more specific after the event is closed. And of course, it leads right into the whole feeling of the Infinity War event kit itself. So every player is going to walk away with a full set of these just for signing up and playing in the game. In addition, uh, it is a league event, so there is going to be progression over the course of the game. And the way that we track progression in this kit is that um, you're going to get an Infinity War League tracker card. You'll see that it has three separate boxes here. We'll get to why those boxes exist, but effectively what's going to be happening over the course of the game is that the whole point of the League is to maintain and uh, develop your control over the various Infinity Stones or gems um, as the game progresses. As you do that, you're going to make choices which are going to unlock some incredible powers that you're going to be able to utilize, and you're going to do that by using these sticker sheets. So every player is also going to walk away with a full set of sticker sheets. There are three stickers per gem. Uh, those gems uh, and those stickers get to be unlocked based on the games that you play. So as you play games, you're going to get to choose stickers off of the sheet based on the missions and the crises that you played during the league. You can unlock one of those abilities, put it on your Infinity War tracker card as a sticker itself. And this card, all the abilities on it are effectively yours to use in every game that you play in the league. Uh, so as the course of the league progresses, you're going to become more and more powerful as your control over the various infinity powers from the gems themselves um, begin to build up. And this is going to lead to a lot of different choices based on which gems you like, what's going on uh, with your games, what your opponents are like, what you want to do overall. Uh, these abilities were a blast to come up with in terms of development, and um, we had a lot of fun thinking them up. You'll notice that some of them did appear in the Gen Con specific event, uh, but there's a whole lot more now as well. Of course, by the end of the campaign, after your card is filled up with stickers, again, if you want to in the future, you can always do an event or have a playthrough with your opponent that allows you to use your Infinity War League card with all of your Infinity War powers, utilizing the Infinity War Crises. If you so choose to, you can use them in regular games as well with your opponent's consent. Uh, there's tons of opportunity here. Again, these are your materials to use as you want and to enjoy the fruits of the event later on um, for those asking in the chat, Vibranium Heist is still available as far as I know, so your store should be able to get it from their local distributor uh, that distributes Asmodee products. Um, they're still in stock. Uh, we have not sold out of them, I think. Um, so depending on the area, I can't speak to every area specifically, but if you're interested in still getting your hands on that event kit, absolutely have your store check in and follow up. Of course, you're gonna need a lot of tokens uh, to track all of the different missions and abilities uh, and the things that are going on in the event. So there's a double-sided token sheet so that you can set up uh, the different gems that you're going to have to control through the crises, the different elements that happen in those crises as well. All this stuff, again, materials that you can use later on. If you want to play those crisis cards in the future outside of the event with opponents or anything like that, you can absolutely uh, do that. And you're going to be able to walk, home, uh, walk away from the event with all of that stuff as well. So in addition to all the game contents, the token sheet, the six brand new Infinity War themed crises, and of course your tracker sheet and your sticker sheets in order to track your progress and unlock your Infinity War powers throughout the course of the game. You're also gonna have a chance to walk away with two brand new uh, acrylic token trackers, which represent uh, the sinister Black Order with the Thanos gauntlet, and of course the intrepid Avengers who oppose the Black Order. Um, if you happen to play in the Initiation League, I believe, um, you'll know these tokens from the VP Tracker there as well. Again, Initiation League is also open, so if you're looking for something um, to kind of jumpstart your community or bring in new people, uh, your stores can order the Initiation League as well and get the cool exclusive prizes and stuff that were in that um, for joining in and learning Crisis Protocol and building your community. Um, these tokens are utilized in two different ways. You get the Avengers one uh, for simply playing in the campaign. So as long as you play in the league uh, and you go all three weeks, you're going to walk away with the Avengers one. If you play at least one game with a fully painted uh, squad, you're going to walk away with the Black Order acrylic token. 
So you can earn both of these. It doesn't matter if you win, lose, draw. Um, you can get these simply by playing and participating in the league themselves. They're going to be something that you can bring with you. You can use in games on the tracking sheet and all that stuff to show off that you were part of this event. That's in addition to all of the game materials as well. Every player is going to walk away with all that stuff. Um, we're really excited about this. It's going to be a lot of fun. It is our first league event, uh, and it does have kind of an evolving story. Things get crazier as the weeks progress, as players become more powerful. Um, so definitely, if you have a local game store, be sure to talk to them about picking up this, this kit. It's going to be available right now. I believe they can put in the order. It's going to come out in March. Uh, players can, of course, um, play this whenever works for them. And again, there's a lot of uh, material that we've passed out to our distribution partners who can talk specifically about um, our recommendations for running organized play safely within the current global situation. We've made a lot of flexibility um, and we really wanna make sure that players are able to get together in the safest way possible, get all these cool uh, prizes and game materials and be able to build up their collections. Uh, we started with Vibranium Heist, we're moving into uh, Infinity War. So this one's now. Uh, I hope that everyone out there gets a chance to get their hands on this kit, um, have a lot of fun with the scenarios. These are some of my favorite crises that we've actually made for the game. They're a little zany, they're a little off the wall, but it's super awesome. Um, so that is the full kit and all of its contents. Um, I know that there was something going around online which talked about character promos. I don't know where that information came from. Um, this is what you get. So the primary materials are the tracker tokens as the awards uh, for simply playing in the event and painting. And then of course, all of the um, crisis cards and materials for playing in the different crises and missions, which are yours to keep as well. So that is Infinity War. I'm going to move all this stuff off to the side. Um, and then I'm going to recenter the camera because I have a special guest to paint today. I don't know how many people have been tuning in regularly to uh, some of the entertainment that we have access to every Friday or paying attention to kind of um, what's happening with Marvel. But I happen to have a surprise guest show up at my door uh, this weekend. And I thought, why the heck not? Let's go ahead and get some paint today on this fella because I believe that we can do uh, this guy up right quick. And so this is Quicksilver, the man, the myth, the legend um, from the upcoming Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver pack. Uh, because I knew I was going to spend some of my time today doing the unboxing, I figured we might as well paint Mr. Pietro. Uh, and what better time than this week based on, um, you know, if you're paying attention to, to Disney Plus and, and this last Friday, I just felt like we had, we had to dive in. I had to paint me some sweet, sweet Quicksilver. Um, just been having a lot of fun with WandaVision. So let's, let's get to it. Um, this, of course, is a very uh, comic-inspired um, Quicksilver. He's going to be in his traditional dudge. So we're going to grab uh, some colors that are going to try to match that and just have some fun putting some paint on this guy today. I'm going to go ahead and start by grabbing a really light kind of teal. What do I want to use here? I think, I think we're going to go with this sky blue. So we're going to start with sky blue from the scale range. Uh, we're going to thin this down to a wash. I did do my typical Zenith Prime. So we're just going to turn this into our standard kind of wash. We're going to wash this over all of the suit, except for the lightning bolts and stuff like that. Um, which we will maintain as a white and we'll just have some fun and play around with Quicksilver. He was certainly one of the more fun ones to design from a game dev standpoint and kind of his abilities. It's always a unique challenge to have to deal with a speedster um, because they can do things that are uh, rather overpowered in so many ways <laughs> that coming up with a good kind of approach to making sure that they're both fun, thematic, and yet balanced um, can certainly be a bit of a challenge. But I'm really happy with where we wound up with Quicksilver. I promised BK I wouldn't give any specific rules spoilers because uh, we are pretty far out. Like any good speedster, he is well ahead of the rest of the pack in terms of his timing. Um, but we just I just felt like we had to paint, we had to put some paint on Mr. Pietro today. Um, just been having so much fun kind of seeing this character come back to life in a really, uh, really exciting and interesting way. 
So again, we're just gonna turn this into a wash. I'm a little thick here, I wanna thin that down a bit. So I'll get back to a little bit more water. Spread this out. I'm gonna be very careful around the face. I don't wanna try, try to avoid getting anything on the skin. And again, I'm gonna to try to avoid um, getting any color on the lightning bolt or the areas of the costume that I want to be white, which are gonna be the boots, the gloves, his sweet, sweet lightning bolt down, crisscrossing his chest and his back. Um, and that's just gonna hopefully save us a little bit of time and effort to get this fellow painted in under an hour for the tabletop. We're gonna be as quick as we can here. Pietro style fast. <clears throat> But we have a lot of fun stuff coming. We're going to be working on. I know a bunch of people saw Domino and Cable. BK posted those the other day. Um, super awesome characters. The Cable sculpt is just phenomenal. The Domino sculpt, we really tried to play into that whole look. Feel with her riding a skateboard of explosions and rocks. Um, two of my all-time favorite mutant characters. Uh, more so than really most of the X-Men. I was always a bigger X-Force kind of fan, especially when it came to Domino and Cable. Uh, so it was very fun to work on those characters as well. I'm really excited to be diving into them. And of course, we still have a lot more Deadpool action coming as well. I believe Dallas this week is going to be working a bit more on the taco truck, which he started to turn into a masterful work of art last Thursday. If you missed that, you should check it out. On the archives of the YouTubes, it was uh, he turned he turned his taco window into basically a Picasso. It was crazy and wild, and loved every minute of it. Even though at the same time I was like, "What are you doing?" But we will be moving on to Cable and Domino next. I think BK has lots of really great spoiler stuff in store for them. Of course, I'm really excited to uh, see folks. <laughs> get their hands on the Infinity War kit, start playing games with their friends, their community, uh, enjoy some of the zany powers that we came up with for the different stones. Can't wait to see which ones um, players gravitate towards. I certainly had my favorites during playtest, but um, I think there's something in there for everyone. Like I said, we were Cackling like crazy the day we came up with them. I can't count the number of times we were like, there's no way we could do that. That's way too powerful. And then we did it anyway, because it's a league and, you know, what's the point of having a fun, crazy event if you're not just going to take it to that next level? Uh, so recommendations for players who don't have events or don't have LGSs. So I know that... Um, some stores have been doing things because of our new remote system. Um, if you can find an LGS that is running something um, decentralized, I think we had a couple of places during the pandemic that were doing that. So it was kind of like by mail, um, you were able to sign up for the kit and become involved with the store and the event. Um, again, you know, one of the big things that we're trying to do based with our organized play and just moving forward is to open up those restrictions so that players can um, work with their stores to do things in a different way. So, you know, kind of gone are the days where everybody has to be in the same room at the same time in order to run even something like Vibranium Heist. Um, and I think this really opens up opportunities for players to hopefully find ways to get access to these events, to participate with their local communities, and to see more of a, a wider group effort when it comes to how these things are organized and run. Um, of course, there's always going to be considerations that we have to make. You know, the goal, again, for any organized play is to really build community and to make the central local gaming store kind of the hub of that that system and, and to provide, you know, that additional kind of value and excitement because where would we be without our local game stores? Um, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here in this chair without mine back in Great Falls, Montana. Um, that introduced me to hobby miniatures games and all this stuff. So it's really important to us that we support 
our great retailers and the folks who help build these wonderful communities at a very basic community level. Um, but we're always looking for ways to improve and ways to bring more people in. And um, obviously, you know, there's there's always challenges, but we're ever trying to evolve. And last year, I think, was a really great step forward for us to be able to think differently about how we do these things and what's really important and stuff like that. So, so that is um, that is kind of the step on that. Again, uh, I would just encourage you to, to talk to whatever local store that's close, even if there's one like two towns away, um, and see what they've got going on with their community. Because again, all of these events can be played um, in kind of a decentralized fashion. You don't have to be in the store in order to do it. There's a lot of opportunity to kind of spread out and build wider and broader communities, even from that really important central game store location. I see the chat is also talking about Quicksilver and his pose and everything that's going on. So obviously he is running super fast up this explosion. I'm kind of using his speed to outdistance the big, the big fireball that's coming behind him. I really like how we were able to get him up in the air. Um, Gail Gourmand, who did the sculpt for this guy, just did a fantastic job capturing that super iconic running pose. Like you can just feel him moving forward. Uh, really really great mini and a lot of fun. I'm going to switch over and we're going to do the whites now. I'm going to move on to my Arctic blue. This is kind of going to be my base coat over the Zenith Prime white. It's going to give me a nice kind of cool blue white, which I use a lot on the show. I don't know if we're going to get into any Holder blue today. Sorry, but I did say it. So there you go. We've, we've at least covered our Holder blue quota of speaking its its hollowed name on the stream. Uh, so again, I've just kind of like thinned down this Arctic blue and I'm just gonna kind of run over the top of the places that I want to be white as our first base coat kind of wash of that sky blue dries out. I'm just kind of being careful going around these areas, painting them in sections, building stuff out. How fast does he move? He moves very fast on the board. Very, very fast. Um, I'm sure no one will be surprised by which movement tool he utilizes. Uh, hopefully people will be kind of thrilled with how many times he gets to utilize that movement tool, but that's probably all I can say. <laughs> um, now, again, like I kind of mentioned, speedsters are always such a conundrum because for whatever reason, a lot of the times they're not treated with kind of the incredible awe and power in stories that maybe they should have. There's a really great scene uh, in one of the X-Men comics that leads up to Fatal Attraction. It might even be part of that um, anthology where like, Quicksilver's kind of hanging out and one of the Brotherhood members comes up and starts talking to him and they're like, I don't know why you left us. Why don't you rejoin the Brotherhood? You don't seem really interested in helping anybody here anyway because like things are blowing up in this factory or whatever. And Quicksilver's like, you think that I'm just standing here watching things happen, but what I've actually been doing and it kind of goes through and it shows like what he's been doing the whole time and he's like saving all these people. It's very um, people talking about, you know, that scene out of uh, the X-Men movies where he's running through the X-Mansion saving anybody with his headphones on, right? It's That scene was, I think, heavily influenced by this sequence in the comics because um, it's very similar. It's just him saving civilians and stuff. And he's like, I've done all this stuff in the two seconds that you thought I was just standing there watching everything happen. And it was a really great moment, I thought, for Quicksilver and just how impressive those powers can be. And it always stuck with me. Um, it was definitely something that, you know, we wanted to try to capture on the tabletop and to make Quicksilver feel like the speedster that he was. Um, it was a fun challenge. So I'm sure we'll be talking more and more about the specifics of how we went about that and what we attempted to do and how we did it. And I have no doubt that, uh, you know, all of you out there will have plenty of 
fun conversations about whether we succeeded or whether we didn't and where does he fit. It's part of the joy of the hobby, right? It doesn't just end at the painting table. It doesn't just end at the game table. You know, it, it gets to extend into all aspects of kind of our imagination and our conversations. And that's what makes hobby so special. Not only improving your skills just on the painting table or the game table, but, you know, building those relationships and having that theory crafting and all of that stuff happen. That's probably the biggest thing I miss most about being able to go into a game store or just sit down and hang out is the chance to, to gab and talk and feel so lucky that we have so many amazing community sites and podcasts and different places where we can go and debate and discuss which character is where on the tier list and how do you get the most out of X, Y, or Z. It's awesome. I mean, it's, it's the thing that I think keeps everybody in and, and going and excited to get to that game table again, prove out those theories, prove people wrong, come up with that new combination. It's all the stuff. So, all right. So I'm going to just go into the gloves and again, kind of hitting all this stuff up. I don't know. I don't think I'm going to use this color for the hair. I think I'm going to use a different, probably more neutral gray tone just to make the hair feel a little different from the cloth. Although I could very easily make the white of the hair match. I think we're going to do something a little different. So leave this on. I think we'll go back to our blue. We'll do a couple of highlights. Oh man, that was a big mistake right there. You see that? I slipped. And of course, the one time I don't have that second brush in my in my teeth. It's okay. I had him right next to me though. There you go. That's that's how easy it is to clean up mistakes if you got that spare brush around. To this, I just want to hit the rest of the glove. I'll just get that color in there. <laughs> All right, pretty happy with that. Just make sure that finish out the sweet lightning bolt. I love Quicksilver's costume because I feel like, you know, it feels like a Halloween costume his mom made him. It's like, I want to be, I want to be a fast superhero. And she's like, what does that mean? It's like, I don't know. Just make me, make me look fast. Put a lightning bolt on it, mom. And there you go. That's how you know. That's how you know it goes fast. You either make it red or you put a lightning bolt on it. Nailed it. Nailed it, Quicksilver. You're ready to go. All right. Looking pretty good so far. Uh, this this is, um, I mean, I think I can answer the, the question about chat, like which version of Quicksilver. So this is definitely, this is definitely the mutant brotherhood, you know, era X-Men storyline Quicksilver here. So. Um, certainly once again kind of drawing from that Jim Lee era uh, 90s kind of feel and classic that all of our X-Men designs are very evocative of if not outright just copies of um, that's kind of just the decision we made looking at you know where we felt we would get the most um, the most out of our designs and what excited us most to start. You know, there's so many great iterations and options when it comes to every Marvel character, mutants more so than many. Um, so this was, but we're all kind of kids of the nineties, I think. And in a lot of ways it could be just biased based on our age and stuff. And, um, there's such a fun, it's a fun place to explore. So I just grabbed some cyan blue and I'm just kind of like mixing in 
a little bit of a, a really thin wash and shading down the blue of the costume just to get a little contrast. Just kind of push those shadows. Trying to be pretty careful with the wash though so that I don't pull away from that baby blue color. I'm keeping it very, very thin. I'm really just using water for this. Almost like a glaze. And then of course, trying to be as careful as possible not to hit my white because that would also not be great. We don't want to have to go back and redo that. And this is partially because I feel like, well, the, the sky blue really hit the color that I wanted for the midtone. Um, it didn't quite affect the shadows as dark as I wanted to. So I'm just going to go back in and push that a little bit with this wash so that we get a little more a little more contrast out of our quicksilver here. I hope everyone, at least as far as the US goes, I don't know how the rest of the world is currently. But we're we're all definitely suffering through a bit of harsh winter. You know, the Seattle area and the everywhere area where I am, we got socked in with some, I want to say uncharacteristic snow, but it snows here at least like once a year, it feels like. But this year it was, um, it was a good, I think we got like seven or eight inches, which is pretty impressive for here. It's still sort of on the ground. It's melting today finally, but of course my kids loved it. They were super excited. For their one snow day, they spent all weekend outside, which was awesome. Um, just playing in the snow. We took the dogs out. They really liked it. So that was kind of a fun change of pace. I'm glad it happened over the weekend. We didn't have to go anywhere or anything. I know for others, it's been a bit more of a rougher patch. I hope that you're all staying safe and, you know, we're... We're crossing our fingers that you get back to normal quick. Several of my compatriots in Roseville, our fine AMG folk, whoop, coming off the camera, uh, holding down the fort in Roseville. We saw some negative 20 degrees posts from them. I do not miss those days. <laughs> that was kind of my only real recourse. I was like, well, I've been there. I lived that life. I'm glad I don't do it anymore because negative 20 is not fun. All right. Oh, get back into focus there, Quicksilver. There you go. Getting too far away. All right. So we got a little bit of that wash working in our shadows now, like taking down that color, giving us a bit more contrast and stuff. <laughs> so I was asking in the chat. Um, no, there there was no winks, no winks. Um, we always kind of knew looking at the overall brotherhood and where we wanted to go with the original kind of the X Men stuff. Um, you know, the twins were always in the plans from day one. We kind of knew that was going to be part of the follow up to that great antagonistic team to the X Men, and of course. Um, you have the crossover of those characters from the Brotherhood to, you know, everyone's favorite Avengers. So again, two characters that are so iconic of Marvel and so important to the um, universe and the mythos of that place that it's hard to just say, well, why wouldn't you? So I'm gonna take some flat white. We're gonna work on that white some more. Again, going back to my Arctic blue, uh, and I'm just going to mix in some flat white and we're going to create a little bit of a quick highlight for the white areas on the suit. And then I think we're going to dive in and we'll hit the face and we'll hit the hair. And by about that time, we will hopefully have ourselves, minus the base, a nice looking tabletop ready Quicksilver to go help his 
daddy o master of magnetism, steal himself some senators and other tchotchkes. I'm just going to kind of come in. I'm just using a little bit of a layer process. So I'm hitting most of the areas that are white, especially when it comes to this kind of shirt lightning bolt. Leaving just a little bit of that shadow color showing underneath. Um, but because this element I find to be really important to the costume, I'm okay with kind of pushing the highlights more than I would on something else. So we can take this to kind of like the next level of brightness. I talk about this a lot. So for those of you who watch the show, or the streams all the time, it's probably kind of old hat, but I like to say it every time anyway. White is primarily defined by its shadow. So again, I'm not really painting with pure white here. I'm painting with more of a bluish gray, but your eye's gonna see it as white. And I'm gonna need a lot smoother and more natural looking color by doing it this way than I would if I tried to just go with a pure flat white from the bottle. Um, or even the airbrush or anything else. So you do want to use just a little bit of spot white highlights, just the tiniest amount on the edges or where the light would really hit the highest points of the area. Um, that will help to find your volumes and it will cheat the eye into seeing everything else as more pure white than it actually is. I was watching a great tutorial video over the weekend. I was talking about like art and whites and how almost everything that you think of as white and like these really great pieces of art. Absolutely not. It's anything but white, but because there's just the minimal amount of white there, you, you see it as white, you understand that it's white. It was kind of interesting and cool. Um, probably a little too like high philosophy for me to really like start playing with, honestly, on my crisis protocol minis or other things, but I did really appreciate the explanation. Find it really fun to scratch the surface on that stuff, even if I'm not interested in, you know, I'll stick my toe in. I'm not diving in whole hog though. I that's that's not fun for me. This is this is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be like an amazing hobby. Something I do to relax and and enjoy myself. Um, so I like to improve and I love to learn new tricks and techniques, but I don't I don't need to you know, make award-winning art. That's, that's not my life. It's not my goal. If it was, you know, that, that would be cool. Then I would go in and do that. But um, I'm very happy with kind of the path that I've charted and, you know, just improving a little bit, not worrying about why certain things work or pushing artistic endeavors or vision. I'll leave that. I'll leave that to other folk. I'm just going to sit here and make things that I think are cool for the shelf and the game table. So the nice thing here is that Quicksilver's boots have a lot of really great sculpted detail. Um, so I'm kind of just going in with a little bit of an overbrushing technique and allowing the white to mostly just pick up those raised edges, edges rather than really, really worry about putting in smart layers. Again, anything that gets us really solid results quick, I am all for. So utilize the miniature and the paint and what it wants to do to make your life better and easier. And it's just gonna lead to more success and much more excitement and fun. I'm like, I could, you know, again, like we talked about, we're just going to take this guy to kind of what I would consider a really great tabletop level. And that's going to change based on person to person. You know, we might have just done those first base coats and we're like, yeah, this is great. We're done. Let's get them on the table. Now doing fine too. Um, we're going to do a couple of highlights and a couple other things too. And, and chances are, after the stream, when I'm hanging out on Thursdays at my paint, my paint jam. I'll come back to this fella and 
just take a few extra steps just to push him even further to where I want him. And that's another really great thing about the hobby and painting in general is that you can always go back and build on what you did as your skills grow and they improve, or you can apply that stuff somewhere else, you know? The, whoop, sorry, getting a little off camera there. The options are really open to your hobby, to your miniatures. You know, enjoy it the way you want to enjoy it. Yeah, we could absolutely do his, his gloves and boots and silver. I mean, I think you could do a really awesome, you know, you could do the lightning bolt gold. You could do all kinds of things when it comes down to, um, you know, making him feel flashy and fast. Like I said, uh, he's kind of doing a traditional take on his thing. I'm not doing the underwear, though, so there's a choice that I'm making. Um, some of his classic costumes, he kind of has these, I don't even know if it's a separate piece of cloth, but kind of has like runner shorts on and they're really dark, like deep blue black. Um, I'm not doing that here. I'm just kind of keeping it as a solid blue bodysuit. One, because it's a little faster to do that way. And two, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in the camp of superhero undies. Like that's just not me. I didn't do my Wolverine that way. I kind of avoid it whenever I can. There's a certain nostalgia and classic look to that, but um, it's just not for me, you know? I I prefer that my characters wear their undies on the inside. Maybe that maybe that makes them less powerful. I don't know. Could kind of be like a Samson hair thing. I don't, I don't go to those meetings. I can't tell you for sure. I'm just kind of going back through, and I'm using the exact same white color, but because the paint is not perfectly opaque, and I'm keeping it nice and thinned down, I can actually get more stark results without having to mix in more white, just by building up my layers a bit more. And this is another really great trick, is that you don't always have to add in more of your highlight color. If you're keeping those paints nice and um, smooth, you can just go back and increase your contrast by simply doing more layers. For those asking about the game mats, I don't have, unfortunately, any info on that. Um, they're still in circulation. I, I don't know what the production plan for those are. Obviously, um, I, I hope that those will get figured out and stuff, but I'm afraid I don't have any more specific information outside of. Um, they're still products. They still exist in the catalog. I imagine that um, if anything, there's probably some production stuff due to the current situation and everything that's getting figured out on that end, but hopefully, um, we'll be seeing those back in stock at some point in the future, or if we have info, as soon as we have more info one way or the other, um, you know, we try to, we try to let you guys know everything that's happening as soon as we know it. Transparency is really important. Bad news or good news doesn't really matter. Um, we don't, we're not really interested in keeping people guessing. So just know if we haven't said anything or don't have information as soon as we do, um, we'll try to make it public as, as fast as possible and as soon as we can. All right, so let's go ahead and hit Quicksilver's face. I'm just going to grab some Ishtar pink, Yoop. which I really like to use as a base for my for my skin. Uh, I find it to be a little too pink though, so mix that in with some basic flesh. You can also just make your own skin tones utilizing primarily white, yellow, and black. And then of course you can use greens, purples, blues, all that stuff for undertoning. Um, so there's there's a lot of opportunity um, to really explore different skin tones. And that is something that I'm definitely becoming more and more practiced on. I've been watching a lot of videos about how to do various skin tones and mixing your own colors and all that stuff. There's no wrong way to do it. All these colors will get you different results. 
But uh, for something like this, where we're just getting ourselves to a tabletop standard, and trying to be a little speedy, grabbing it straight from the pot, especially when I know exactly the result that I'm going to get, 100% worth it. Big trick here. I find, and I may be alone in this, but I do find that a lot of flesh tones from the pot often wind up getting really, really gritty. Um, they can be kind of thick. So I do always try to take extra care in thinning out the flesh tones because you really want that layer to be nice and smooth and even because there any kind of like bump or kind of thickness to the paint application is going to change the way the face looks in general. And so a couple of thin coats, one might say two thin coats, although I've Never found that number to be precise on anything. Um, it's always better than one super gloopy coat on your character's skin, especially their faces. All right. I'm just gonna make sure to get his ear. Sweet. Cool. All right, so first layer down, I'm gonna go ahead and grab uh, just some general flesh wash from Vallejo, because scale doesn't really make any. And I'm gonna drop that into the pile. So any flash wash will work. You can obviously also mix up your own flesh washes using red and green or blue or purple, depending on what you're doing. Um, again, it's not really too many wrong ways to do it. If you want really natural skin tones and you wanna kind of go into that worthy competition level of painting, doing a green followed by a red kind of glaze or wash will really net you some really nice looking skin results. Um, you can layer up from a much redder or purpler tone. Yeah, I think this is, again, like we talk about, or I like to talk about a lot, one of the really awesome things about this hobby is there's really no wrong way to do anything. Everybody does it kind of their own way. It's like cooking. No one cooks exactly the same. You learn cooking by mimicry. And I think that's, you know, hopefully what we try to do here is show a bunch of techniques that you can, you can mimic and try out yourself. But when you actually start cooking for real, and when you start painting for real, it's when you just go, oh yeah, I remember I'm kind of doing this, but this feels better to me, or this works nicer with the paint. I like this result better. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you've developed your own style. You're making those flavors work. So, all right, so we got that nice shade going down on the face. We'll let that dry. Let's hit his, let's hit his hair really quick. I don't know if I want to get to highlight that blue, but that's okay. All right, so <clears throat> we're in a pretty good spot on the hair. I'm going to just grab a little, where is it? Where's my rainy gray? I'm gonna grab a little rainy gray. I'm gonna thin it down to a nice wash. And then we're just gonna put that into the hair and let the sculpted details do most of the work for us to give us that volume and that contrast. Thin this down quite a lot. We'll see if it we'll see if it cooperates with me here. I'm just gonna come in, hit it, rely a bit more on that zenith prime. Do some of the work here. <clears throat> and likely 
what I find myself wanting to do once this dries, which we may not get to with nine minutes left because it's pretty thin, is come back and just do a really quick like dry brush over the hair because it's got all this great texture. Just kind of reclaim those, those highest points. But you can see how now we already have some really nice contrast to that hair. So it really would just be coming in, doing these little wing tips and stuff with a bit of that maybe Arctic blue or some kind of other off pure white. I'd be ready to go. All right, so I'm really happy with where our Quicksilver is looking. Honestly, um, we're like right on the cusp of, of being done. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna highlight his skin really quick. And we're just gonna do a couple of really simple highlights. Maybe we'll wash a little purple into those eye sockets just to give them a bit more life. Another trick that I discovered recently thanks to all the amazing resources online and stuff. Just a wealth of amazing painters out there so willing to share their knowledge, tips, and tricks. Every craftsman learns from other craftsmen. So, you know, if you enjoy it, take your time and See what else is out there. I'm just gonna hit the eyebrows, kind of get the chin, get the cheekbones, and grab that other brush, and I'm just gonna blend that cheekbone down. So, that nice, it's got these nice chiseled features, and he's pretty. He is one handsome man. Come over here. And just kind of like laying some color on the cheek. Grab that color and just kind of pull it down. Just to blend it out. Do a little color across that jawline. A little bit on the temple, a little much. It's okay. Kind of blend that out. I'll come over here. This temple's kind of hidden. I'm gonna say this temple's a little more in shadow. A little bit more. Let's see. Maybe this. Get a little closer so you can see what's going on here. Come up and over. Like that. Go one more time over the eyebrows, and then maybe hit this part of the forehead a little bit. That sun would hit cheek, one more shot over the nose, come over here, that chin again. up and out, give them that really high cheekbone. A little bit of straining muscles on the neck, Urgh, those tendons. He's running real fast, real fast. Even for Pietro, he's working hard. There's our face. Ooh, I think that wash might have dried quick enough. So let's, I'm gonna grab, this'll work. I'm gonna use some white sands. Oh, 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 there we go. Has a little bit of yellow in it. A little bit of an eggshell. How do I make skin look so easy? Man, I'm glad, I'm glad, Chet, that it looks easy. Um, I, I worked really hard at it, and I still am not super thrilled with the way <laughs> that my skin's come out from time to time. But you know, it's just perseverance. Um, and like I said, I love watching, I love watching videos of other people and taking their kind of ideas and stuff and utilizing them. There's so many great, I mean, we're just, we're so lucky these days to 
have access to so much knowledge and information. You know, I learned painting from my, like, honestly, I learned painting from my mom when I started doing hobby miniatures. I mean, my mom and my dad, my dad did hobby, hobby airplanes. Um, and so we paint those every once in a while. And I started building those when I was like, I think I started building those with him when I was about five. And so that was kind of my only exposure, you know, your, your, your enamel paints and how to put things together. That kind of got me the bug of building things and hobby miniatures in general. And then, and then I found hobby miniatures games, thanks to my awesome, my awesome local game store kind of introduced me to stuff. I was a, I was a card game player for a little bit. I really liked CCGs and, um, they're like, hey, what about what about this over here? Look at all these cool, these cool hobby miniatures. Aren't they awesome? And I was like, those really are awesome. And I kind of got into it, but the only person who could teach me how to paint because nobody did it at the time, and you know, we didn't have a lot of online resources. We had no online resources back then because I'm a dinosaur. Feels like some days when my kids talk. Um, you know, my mom painted some crafts. She had some artistic ability. She had taken some art classes and she kind of along with the help of some very rudimentary how-to pamphlets from different from different game products kind of walked me through okay well this is I think you do it this way and you kind of do that and I'd get to a character like some really fancy character that I was super excited about and bless her heart she'd paint it for me because I was like there's no way I can do it right mom can you do it um and I still have I still have several of those that she did, and I can outpaint her now, twenty plus years later. But at the time, when she was, she was huge. So never, never discount how important it is to be a mentor and to help others along their journey. Even if you don't know a ton, you know more than somebody, and you know you never know what they're going to go on to do if you just give them a little bit of time. Time is the most valuable thing we can give to each other. And I think a lot of the times we we forget that. We look at things in value in other ways, but man, I never have more fun than just sitting down and showing people how to paint and figure out how to learn a new skill or learn a new skill myself, you know? Super fun. All right, so there, we got our, we got our highlights up. Our hair's looking really good. We went on a philosophical adventure here. I'm going to grab just a little bit of some purple wash, and I just want to thin that out. I'm going to hit the eyes, the eye sockets on Pietro here really quick, because I am not interested in painting his eyes. Um, so this will kind of cheat for us, and it'll give us a nice little... saturation of those eye sockets and because his face is you know only five mil tall so just kind of give us that natural feeling of color put a bit more warmth and life into those eyes you can do this with red browns like whatever whatever works best for you i need to I'm gonna flip them upside down so that i can get into this eye socket here but i really like the purple I don't remember who I saw this from initially, but it's definitely it's definitely kind of taken over my love. I'm getting that kind of natural eye socket look. Oh, I took them off camera for the end. So there you go. So you can see hopefully that purple just added a little bit of life and warmth into those eye sockets. Makes him feel a little bit more awake. And with that, it is 201. So we are gonna call our Pietro ready for the tabletop. So all we have to do is do his explosion base. We'll cover that later. But there's a quick and I think easily achievable, fantastic result for Pietro Maximoff. He's ready to dash in, save the day, or you know, uh make off with the important tchotchke for his for his daddy his his daddy magneto 
All right, everyone, pull this off up here, come to here really quick just to do an outro. Take that brush out of my mouth. I don't need it anymore. So thank you so much for joining us today on this uh, very special Atomic Mass Transmissions live. Uh, be sure to talk to your local gaming store about the Infinity War event kit. Uh, it's an amazing league. You get to run it for three weeks. It has a lot of opportunity to be able to run safely and securely within the pandemic situation. And of course, it's going to give you all of those awesome materials that you can add to your game collection, play with whenever you like in the future against your opponents. Come back like a back issue, a great back issue off the shelf. Pull it down and have some fun. It has some amazing crises in it. I personally truly love uh, many of them. They're just zany and a uh, completely different take on some of the battles that we have on the normal Marvel Crisis Protocol shelf. And of course, you're also going to get some cool tchotchkes just for playing and painting as well. Thanks so much for joining us. Be sure to check us out uh, tomorrow, 1 p.m. Pacific. We're going to be diving back in uh, with some more fun paint. Dallas is going to be painting the taco truck from Deadpool at Thursday at 1 p.m. as well. And then, of course, we have our final stream on Friday at 1 p.m. So if you're interested in any of our other games that are not MCP, be sure to check out uh, tomorrow and Friday. We're going to be having a lot of fun. Otherwise, watch our socials. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all of that good stuff. We have plenty of good content coming. I know BK has some great spoilers coming in. I also know that Schaefer has some fun stuff coming in as well. And of course, don't forget, you have, I think, a week left for this month's Marvel Crisis Protocol hashtag painting protocol challenge, which is royalty. Show us your sweet, sweet royalty paint jobs, whatever that means to you, whether that's in human royal family, whether that's color choices, whether that's just somebody that you view as royalty, hashtag that painting protocol. And we are going to be checking those out at the end of the week. We will be posting up the winners and announcing those on stream uh, at the start of March. And of course, be sure to watch out for more information on our upcoming March extravaganza. I still call it a constravaganza. I'm told that's not the final name, but you know, I can live with it. Um, we're going to be taking three days in March. Uh, I think the third week in March, uh, if I'm correct, but somebody in the chat will fix me if I'm not. And we're going to be doing all kinds of awesome painting streams, hobby streams, development chats, all kinds of good stuff. It's going to be a blast. We're going to try to live that convention life uh, safely over the digital airspace like we did last year for virtual Gen Con. Uh, more information on that stuff is coming. Be sure to check all that stuff out. Again, the best way to stay connected is through the social media channels. And of course, we will see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific, Thursday, 1 p.m. Pacific, and Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, if not, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Be safe. Be good to each other. Goodbye.